I'm Jason Lewis. And I'm Flora Gladwin. Welcome to Climate Optimus. As a couple concerned citizens, we're on a journey to explore climate solutions and ways each of us can make a difference. So our co-host Thomas is on a much deserved vacation this week, getting in lots of mountain biking, I've heard. So good for him. <laughs> You've a heard. Friendly activity. <laughs> I was going to say, have you not partaken? That's... I did partake. I did partake <laughs> and I'm still sore from the experience. <laughs> Thomas is very fit, um, mm -hmm. and it turns out running doesn't translate well to mountain biking. Yeah, um, But yeah, miss him this week, but he will be back uh, for our next episode. Yeah. So as a nonprofit focused on educating and empowering people to get involved in climate action, we rely on the financial support of our listeners. So if you're a regular listener and you value what you get from us, consider a donation that aligns with that value. Yeah, all you have to do is head over to our website, climateoptimist.co, and click the donate button. Even $5 a month goes a long way in helping us deliver on our mission. And, you know, if you're short on cash, but you want to help out, have your friends subscribe and um, rate us on your streaming platform. Absolutely. And if you're looking for an extra podcast to download for an upcoming road trip or an upcoming mountain biking trip like Thomas, we have a recommendation for you. <laughs> when the People Decide is a podcast about how everyday people are shaping democracy and how you can too. The first season was about people who used ballot initiatives to bring issues they care about directly to their fellow voters, often bypassing state legislators who stood in their way. The second season, which is streaming now, looks at cities and towns that are strengthening democracy at the local level. Learn about how the residents of Petaluma, California, won the democracy lottery and how Durham, North Carolina, is turning over a portion of its budget to residents to spend. The podcast is part of the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and is produced by LWC Studios. Yeah, great podcast. Definitely go check it out. Well, the vast majority of us, in some way or another, Thomas included, are travelers whether we're visiting family or friends or, you know, flying halfway around the world to an exotic location. Mm -hmm. And regardless of why we travel or how far we go, today's journeys leave a footprint on the climate. You know, this can be our source of transportation, where we choose to stay, or even the food we eat while we're away. Today, we have an exciting guest who's going to be helping us dig into the impacts of tourism on the climate and what the industry is doing to address them. But before we go there, let's uh, talk about this week's Reason for Hope. Yeah, I think this is a great one. It feels relevant to, I think, what we'll be getting into later on. Um, but very recently in Nairobi, which is the capital of Kenya, heads of state from different countries in Africa gathered for the continent's first official climate summit. Exciting. I know. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this one. Uh, at the summit, there was a consensus that Africa is ready to lead on clean energy initiatives, but the wealthy industrialized nations that have committed money to the continent need to follow through on their financial commitments, especially considering the fact that these are the countries who are largely responsible for driving global warming. These financial commitments include an astounding $100 billion per year, which nations in Africa have yet to receive on. And although representatives from some of the biggest African economies didn't attend, including Egypt, South Africa, Nigeria, and Ethiopia, this still marks a very important historic moment for global climate change action. Yeah, I think it's great to have, you know, we had the, the Rainforest Summit, um, mm -hmm. I think it was called in, in Brazil recently, and now this summit in Africa, really an opportunity for developing nations to you know, nudge the industrialized countries that have been driving climate change, which I think is the important point, um, to follow through on helping these countries in, invest in mm -hmm. clean energy, you know, protect their forests, et cetera. I mean, the reality is there's still, you know, roughly 600 million people in Africa that have little or no access to electricity. So this isn't just an opportunity to help them reduce their emissions, but help them, you know, in terms of an equity lens. Great point. Well, today we're excited to have Jeremy Sampson on the program. Jeremy is a globally recognized leader and alliance builder who advocates for system change aimed at improving the impact of the travel and tourism sector on communities and the climate crisis. He was instrumental in setting up the Future of Tourism Coalition in 2020. He was also a co-author of the Glasgow Declaration on Climate Action and Tourism, 
launched at the UN Global Climate Conference back in uh, 2021. And he's a regular contributor to media, events, and other publications. And today, Jeremy works as CEO of the nonprofit called the Travel Foundation, where he oversees a global team which has transformed the organization into the leading independent international NGO in the tourism sector. He currently resides in the Pacific Northwest, Spokane, Washington, though he has lived in four different countries and worked on six continents during his career. Jeremy, welcome to Climate Optimus. It's great to be here, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. So let's kick you off with a, a basic question. When it comes to efforts to address climate change, and I know this can be hard some days, but what, what makes you hopeful? Yeah, it can be hard some days, but um, it's the hope that actually uh, that actually keeps me going. And and um, actually, the thing that makes me the most hopeful is that I, I try to zoom out once in a while and look at the, the trajectory that um, that we've been on for, you know, as an organization, for myself as an individual. I think the industry I work on, which is the travel industry, and although it's not nearly fast enough. Um, and, when I zoom out to, to look at, to think about sort of 15 years, 20 years, and, and the things that we were talking about just, you know, just a, a short while ago, um, and how much we had to sort of cushion conversations around even sustainability, which was sort of an, you know, an, an entry level point to, to thinking about you know, deeper issues like, um, like the climate crisis. You know, we've actually made quite a lot of progress. Uh, you know, we we were really uh, in a in a one hundred and one introductory level um, just a few years ago, and, and many companies, um, many places that we work with were were just completely sort of ignoring the the topic. And and um, and and it, it fast forward, you know, just a just a short period of time, and we have seen so many organizations actually start to do something meaningful. On top of that, we, we are starting to see more and more that organizations are recognizing that um, the climate crisis is not something that um, anyone's going to be able to necessarily solve on their own. And so we're seeing, I, I think, and, and I think the climate crisis has has everything to do with this. We're seeing more and more collaboration in the travel industry than, than ever before. And that's at every level from, you know, small destinations where you have businesses joining forces and, and working together to, um, uh, cross-border cooperation where you see governments starting to understand that climate you know doesn't really have borders and and doesn't really care about your you know geographic or administrative boundaries um, companies working together in a pre-competitive environment to to uh, co-invest and identify solutions that might actually have a, a chance at at, a, at changing the game so it's that progress from from where we were just just a short period of time ago, and and the sort of willingness I think to 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 act differently and to think differently. Again, we're not nearly where we need to be, but I think those are the those to me are sort of the roots of change and and uh, and the roots of systems change, which are going to be required if we're ever going to get get ourselves out of this mess. Yeah, indeed, and it, it, good to hear the the collaboration piece because I think you know it's it's one of those things where individually we can't solve it, but individually, we all have an impact. And so that's that, you know, in aggregate, you know, being able to work together, it, it does make a difference. Let's talk a little bit about it. And I know it may be hard to kind of draw a nice and neat, tidy border around the travel industry because it's such a big thing. But can you talk a little bit about how, you know, how does tourism contribute to global emissions, greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah. Uh, so tourism uh, accounts for anywhere from 10 to 13 percent of global emissions again depending as you said on sort of where you draw the border um, sure. transportation is a is a significant aspect of that absolutely you know tourism requires people to move from place to place airlines are certainly part of the equation but not the only part of that equation tourism also when you think about any any place really in the world any any destination any city, Tourism is a significant part of the economy and therefore the supply chain and the way that the supply chain is managed often is um, significantly impacted by the travel industry. So that means um, food and beverage. Um, that means, you know, other sort of raw materials that may be required for putting on a, a, a travel experience. 
So the way I look at it is that tourism has um, a significant role to play regardless. On the one hand, tourism has a, uh, you know, obviously is a significant percentage of, of global emissions. And, and right now with the trajectory that the industry is predicted to continue to go on, which is essentially unfettered growth, that number is predicted to, to nearly, nearly triple by 2050 at a time where we're supposed to be reducing by, you know, reducing by at least half. Um, that's if right. things continue to go the way that they, um, that's if the, the, the trajectory or the line that the tourism has continued, has grown on over the last years continues to be business as usual. What's interesting is that tourism can continue to grow in lots of different ways um, without having to necessarily continue to, to increase its emissions. There can be much smarter growth in travel and tourism by changing the modality of tourism. So that might mean um, traveling by train more or traveling by um, electric vehicle. Um, that might mean staying for a, a longer period of time in a place if you've traveled far to actually stay there longer and and uh, maximize that carbon budget um, that's being expended per you know per visitor. Right. Um, the interesting thing is that tourism is is so essential to the global economy that it's really difficult to talk about not having travel and tourism. In, in 2020, we we learned in many places what that was like. And so what we're really trying to grapple with, and we, we released a report earlier this year called Envisioning Tourism in 2030. The goal of that report was to demonstrate how the travel industry could, um, alongside uh, its uh, business as usual growth trajectory, also achieve um, the climate targets that the industry has signed on to through the Glasgow Declaration, which is uh, essentially aligned with the Paris Agreement. And we were able to demonstrate a scenario using some scenario modeling with our um, partners at, at Breda University in the Netherlands, we are able to demonstrate a scenario that, that would actually represent business as usual growth. Again, changing modalities, um, changing price points, reducing uh, the growth of long haul travel over a period of time, but not reducing things like short haul travel and, and overall visitation and, and shifting the model so that, you know, people are spending longer time in places, um, spending more money, um, you know, in places when they're there on local products, local experiences, and, and ultimately creating a, a smarter model of growth for the industry to start to advocate for. So I guess a lot of things to unpack there, but it sounds like there are opportunities in the industry to reduce emissions kind of sounds like decouple that from growth and that you know has to do with things like maybe traveling more regionally or when you do travel you know staying longer rather than making multiple short trips i guess i i'm wondering you know you mentioned uh, being able to do a road trip where you're taking an ev is the industry working towards sort of common you know definitions for what that might look like i mean obviously driving an ev is you know is a tangible reduction in emissions where you might see some, you know, brands, tourism or not, that are sort of saying, well, we're they're net zero, but they're just getting there by buying a lot of offsets and not really taking meaningful action. How is the industry, you know, handling moving in in that direction, which is obviously a good direction to move, but, you know, ensuring that there's yeah. a greenwashing. Yep. First and foremost, the industry does not really have common definitions for um, for climate, and and I think that's a that's a bit of a concern. The Glasgow Declaration was meant to bring people together to to talk about this in a in a common way, uh, to set a common framework for that could align organizations with Paris and and begin setting um, expectations around uh, around having some standardization. There there is yet to be sort of a expectation of of carbon reporting, you know, and I think that. Um, that's something the industry is grappling with. Part of the problem is that no one knows where their responsibilities sort of start, start and stop. You have, you know, you have sort of a, a public administrations at every level, city, sort of city, state, you know, region, trying to understand what their role and responsibility is in measuring in measuring emissions and where to draw the line and. It's just sort of a big mess, and and we're, we're also discouraging the industry from getting overly paralyzed by that because it would be really easy to focus for the next ten years on figuring out the sort of measurement mess um, without actually taking action. So it's a really sort of risky balance. But the industry ultimately does need some standard reporting around you know around this piece, and and um, there's a. An important aspect of this, uh, which is the uh, online travel agencies, so Expedia, Booking.com, TripAdvisor, Skyscanner, etc., they've all come together um, 
under a sort of pre-competitive collaboration coalition under the banner of an organization called Travelist, which was actually started by Prince Harry um, a couple of years ago, who was interested in the travel industry and trying to figure out what could he actually do to to move things al- along. And when they assessed the entire ecosystem of travel and tourism, they recognized that the, the most important thing they could do was actually bring together those OTAs to think about how to communicate once and for all to the market in a, in a consistent and clear way, because that's never happened before. So until recently, you know, you might see a leaf here and a badge here and an award here. No one knows what any of those things mean. And and everyone's sort of got their own program and their own way of reporting. Yeah. So a lot of moving parts and and something at the end of the day that, you know, obviously you need to have common definitions and measurements and so forth. But the key for the consumer being something that's easily digestible and they can make a, you know, an informed decision on. And, you know, as we're talking about sustainable travel, I think for those who you know, environmentally conscious and, and do travel might be familiar with, you know, what's called ecotourism. And so I, th- I thought, you know, might be worth spending a minute just briefly to kind of talk about what is ecotourism and how does it kind of fit within all of this? Yeah. Um, you know, ecotourism was the industry's first sort of response actually to, to the thought that unfettered growth in tourism forever and ever um, using a sort of mass market model may not be such a good thing. <laughs> um, and so eco you know, the rise of ecotourism at, at first was about identifying alternative ways to um, bring people into places while like leaving, you know, leaving very little trace or, you know, really having a, a, an eco-friendly experience that was in the nature of the of the activity, you know, that you'd spend your time in nature, you weren't spending your time in a necessarily in a in a big built environment, um, and you were very cognizant of the the resources um, that you were um, dependent on, and ultimately trying to to balance out any sort of resource use um, as much as possible. And and at the end of the day, the the promise of ecotourism was that it would also contribute healthily towards conservation objectives. So um, I used to work on ecotourism projects, in fact, in protected areas across the Mediterranean region. And this was uh, an, an, an initiative designed by big conservation organizations as a way to, to value the, the resources um, and help local communities um, uh, see the, the protected areas as, as um, you know, as valuable to their livelihoods. Well, and, and I guess kind of building upon that, I'm wondering, you know, how, yeah, how does the industry, how's the industry thinking about those areas that are being adversely impacted by climate and, you know, how to respond, you know, in a way that's, that's responsible and, um, and, you know, not making the problem worse. Well, a couple of years ago, we we released a report um, with Cornell University and uh, Eplerwood International called The Invisible Burden of Tourism, where we unpacked that very topic. And it it was really interesting to explore, you know, kind of go down the rabbit hole of this idea of of costs and burdens because the industry has been so good at talking about its benefits. And anyone who works in the industry can tell you one in 10 jobs in the world and all of these arrivals and all of this revenue and all of this money. And no one has no one had ever stopped to talk to think about, well, what what is this costing us? (laughs) Um, And and we thought this was a really nice way to frame a question like you just asked that the industry has a really hard time grappling with because no one necessarily wants to take responsibility for that equation. But when we put it in those terms, it becomes really easy to see. So from a climate perspective, here's a here's a very simple example. Um, you have an island, a Greek island like Rhodes, um, which uh, simply to service tourist demand from peak season visitation, um, which is a couple months of the year, um, they were locked into building, you know, entirely new um, power plants that were fossil fuel burning for right. you know ten to fifteen years, and that didn't that didn't need to happen. First of all, that was a choice that was made to to continue to grow during peak season. Um, but it's a it's a perfect example of a cost um, that actually, and, and and those costs they could be um, related to provision of you know, wastewater and energy, they could be um, related to, yeah, to, to building new infrastructure, the costs can go on and on. And ultimately, those costs are either left completely unaccounted for, or are, um, you know, left to the taxpayers to actually subsidize. And when they're left accounted for is where we often see the 
the potential for conflict or for degradation because no one's taking responsibility for the you know for for paying those long term costs. Um, and so, what we've encouraged actually is for um, first of all for destination. So um, the management organizations that run sort of destinations or places that you visit have traditionally been uh, marketing, uh, marketing focused um, organizations. So you live in Oregon, there's Travel Oregon, which is a wonderful organization I've worked with for many years. Travel Oregon's main job funded by the government in Salem is to market Oregon as a as a desirable place to visit. But most of those organizations have started to turn into what are now called destination management organizations. So that's looking at not only the the marketing side, but managing um, and un- trying to understand better the, this um, this ledger, right? These like, what are the costs? What are the benefits? And how do we deliver a net positive? Um, what, what does value look like? And how do we make sure that people are actually, um, you know, benefiting? How do we make sure the environment is not being degraded um, for just for the sake of growth and that sort of thing, and it's and it's those organizations that are important and will will ultimately have to pave the way because I do not see the industry self self regulating. So as we're talking about all this, I mean there is the reality. I think that there are probably going to be times when it makes sense to for the the folks that live there for the the you know the environment as a whole, or maybe you, you don't want tourists for a period of time. I mean, we have the recent events in, in I'm thinking in, in Maui. I guess, what, what are your thoughts on how to kind of balance this, this need to maybe support a local economy with, you know, taking care of the, the environment or, you know, the people that are there given the impacts of climate change? It is really challenging and, and, and really, um, and really, uh, it's, it's really a conflict in, in, in many ways, um, and, and there are different schools of thought. You know, Maui, right away, there were people saying we need we need people to come back right away because we need money. Uh, this is our primary source of income, et cetera, et cetera, and and without this, we will have no way of recovering. And in fact, tourism has done a, has shown a, a positive significant positive contribution when it comes to disaster response, you know, and in some cases getting people in and getting people, getting money flowing through the place can, can make a huge difference at the same time, you know, yeah. Um, the, the other school of thought is, you know, it's like, please stay away. There are other things that we need to deal with right now. And there, there is no simple straight answer. And, and even if you go into a destination and you ask 20 different stakeholders in the industry, you're probably going to get 20 different answers. Sure. It just depends on the uh, on the role that they that they play, so what what we try to do is to, at the very least, um, create a more balanced conversation. We were recently working in Lake Tahoe um, with a, a consortium of organizations there that had never worked together before. There were public sector organizations, private companies, six five or six of these destination management organizations. Very complex, two states, and this big consortium of organizations, all with different agendas which came together and, and, um, and, and agreed on some common principles. For example, one of those important principles was that the, the health of the lake, um, the resource that they all depended on, there was no tra- economic trade-off that was worth risking the health of the lake. And that's a game changer in terms of planning at a, at a sort of regional level for resources, initiatives, solutions that prioritize the health of the lake over, you know, over the, you know, the economic trade-off. So, and these organizations, many of them are still going to have to go back and do their job, which is to promote tourism and bring in people to satisfy the hoteliers that fund their, you know, that fund their organizations and continue to grow tourism. But when they come together for a collective, you know, for a collective thinking and collective action, um, th- these principles are, are going to sit on top of their um, decision making. And that piece is really, really important, I think. So, um, yeah, I think I think ultimately it's it's creating a more participatory, more open and more sort of transparent uh, conversation that that has uh, data at the center, not just emotion, <laughs> you know, and, and make sure that there's a real balance in terms of what people are valuing, what people need and and um, and how to continue to sort of grow an economy that that that. Uh, that ultimately is equitable. Totally. Well, I, I guess that's a good segue to um, to my last question, which is, you know, f- for those of us, certainly our podcast listeners who want to be more climate conscious with their travel, you know, not making the problem worse while while still being able to get out and see the world. Do you have any, you know, recommendations for um, for travelers in terms of trying to, you know, 
be a traveler in, in the world of climate change? Yeah, it's unfortunately challenging to to ha- get as much information as you might want or need about some of the challenges that destinations are facing. If you do your digging, you can find it. Um, I would say it's not always possible, but when when and where one can travel off you know off peak, um, that's that's ideal. Um, you know, tourism destinations need visitors to not be concentrated, um, you know, during just during just uh, six weeks of the year or something like that. And they need people to spend money locally when they're in the de- when they're in the destination. So finding local restaurants, local experiences owned by local people and spending that money in order to sort of uh, maximize that carbon budget, because, you know, all too often you have a carbon budget that then is not even being um, being sort of paid off in the, in the long run by by money um, staying in the you know in the place and uh, and then it's sort of like well what 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 is the sort of positive value here for these places and for these people sure beyond that yeah I mean I think understanding that um, you know emissions uh, from the airline industry are can be challenging and can be um, you know uh, and where uh, there needs to be a bit more thought put into the sort of, I think, the overall recipes. So I would avoid, for example, doing uh, too many long haul trips within a year. That doesn't mean never do them, but right. maybe uh, your long trip to Thailand, um, you know, should only be uh, a really a special occasion, not something that you do every, you know, every six months or something like that. And, and thinking really about transportation, if you can, it's harder in places like the U.S. sometimes, but if you can travel by train, if you can travel, if you can travel by electric vehicle and, and, and reduce some of your own emissions, I think that's, that's a, a, a real positive. And ultimately, we're looking at ways that, that the unsustainable choices can be designed right out of the system right. because um, travelers don't like to have to think about these things. They're on vacation and that's okay. <laughs> you know, a lot of times people are really good. They're really environmentally conscious. They go on vacation and they, they don't know because they're in a foreign place and it can be harder to make decisions. Well, that's too bad. That shouldn't be up to them. We, sh- we should just make sure that those choices are, are not really presented to them. But if you have access to information, you have the time. I think that this information is out there and, and each place is a little bit different. So doing a bit of research or talking to local people, if you know them, is, it will make a big difference. So Miri, you know, get smart about the, the destination and, you know, and its peak season and what, you know, impacts uh, it might be having to deal with from a climate or, you know, broader environmental perspective. And then, and then when you are going, try to, you know, try to maybe stay longer, you know, take fewer trips and, and, you know, when you're getting there, look for opportunities to, you know, travel electric or travel by something like rail. So, I mean, I guess I'm thinking about the classic, like I ski and, you know, you go to a ski destination. I always think it's ironic when, you know, there's all these quad cab pickup trucks or big SUVs at the, at the top of the mountain, knowing that those are the very things that are emitting the carbon that's going to mean there isn't snow in the future. So, um, right. Right. And then it sounds like at the same time, there's a, as you said, like a systems level change that needs to take place. But it sounds like there are things we as individual travelers can do um, to at least do our part and then maybe reinforce um, the value of having, you know, lower carbon uh, choices when we travel. Yeah, I, th- I think the industry is looking for signs that that um, and, and we're seeing this from Generation Z, for example, that value that, you know, the they are asking questions about values. They're asking questions about impact on places, that kind of thing, whether it's tourism or whether it's other industries. And the more that people demonstrate that they, they care, <laughs> you know, that, that really drives change because ultimately at the end of the day, uh, companies are a bit concerned that they won't, that from a reputational perspective, that they're facing risk in the long run because people um, don't see the tourism industry as as um, attractive as as it did a generation ago. I think people are they they do pay attention and 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 know that values and and um, and transparency increasingly are important. So the more the more that they can understand that, the the more they will um, respond in kind. Well, lots of work ahead, but exciting to hear that the industry's moving in that direction. And you know, it sounds like 
each of us has a, has a role to play in, in helping make that transition. Definitely. I mean, I think we all want to travel and, you know, again, travel is a, is good for our planet. It's good for our society. I think it would be a really sad future if we don't get to experience new places and, you know, different sorts of places, but there are already places that have changed so much so that they're not really the special places that they once were. And I, and I hope, um, I hope there's not more of that in, in the future. Um, but, but taking, uh, taking and, and re- recognizing that almost anything can be a, a travel experience and, and opening your eyes to what's around you locally, I, I think can also make a big difference. All of a sudden in COVID, people were finding parks and um, experiences that they'd never sort of uh, visited before or thought of as a as an alternative. And yeah, I think I think there's travel all around us if we sort of open our eyes and, and take that same sense of wonder that you have when you visit, visit somewhere else um, and, and, and thoughtfulness um, um, as well. Well, Jeremy, thanks uh, for all you're doing to help, you know, the travel industry or the tourism industry, you know, green itself, become better from a climate and environmental perspective. And, and of course, thanks for coming on and, and educating us about the, the challenges and, and solutions out there. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate the time. Well, Flora, you know, obviously interested in your perspective, especially given your background in anthropology, science, environmental technology studies. Did I get Mm -hmm. that right? Quite. Yep. Quite the mouthful. But yeah, you got it right. (laughs) As well as I know you did a thesis on Bonaire, the small island next to Aruba, um, Mm -hmm. focused on marine ecotourism. So with that introduction, (laughs) what what were your thoughts on the discussion with Jeremy? Oh my gosh. I was... I was very impressed. I really, I really loved listening. I think that Jeremy covers a lot of things that feel so important and, you know, things that I brought up in my thesis as kind of some of these active solutions to the challenges brought about by both ecotourism, you know, tourism in general, and those industries as they're further complicated by climate change. I really thought that he made a number of great points just about the extent of the of the challenge, the scale of the challenge here. Um, there's definitely a lot to be done still. So, yeah, it, it does seem like there's a big opportunity. And it, while it's always encouraging to see voluntary change taking place, he's, you know, it sounds like there's folks that are starting to turn to drive action. We definitely still need, you know, legislation to help drive down emissions, especially yeah, within the tourist sector. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I, I feel like there's just a huge opportunity here for action on the legislative side. And we've kind of talked about this in past episodes, but, you know, definitely a moment to bring it up again, including the possibility of a carbon fee, which Canada already has. But yeah, a carbon fee and dividend that are, you know, transparent, non-regressive, um, that would increase possibly annually like Canada is doing and have those proceeds being returned to consumers and if you haven't listened to our podcast on Canada, go take a listen because we talk about that there. So for consumers, that means that you know you have more transparency, some accountability on the side of those oil companies and refineries, but also you now have this additional incentive to switch from things like gasoline or heating with natural gas or even like expensive imports to choices that have a much smaller carbon footprint. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, I think as you kind of pointed out, a carbon fee and dividend is a great mechanism, not just in the sense that it prices carbon and, Mm -hmm. you know, provides some predictability to business, but it's that non-regressive part, right? If you're somebody who's lower income, those, you know, incentive payments coming back, that dividend gives Mm -hmm. you money in your pocket to deal with the rising cost of goods. And then hopefully, as you said, people are then moving to you know, technologies that are, you know, more climate friendly. I think the other mechanism that's out there that, you know, has the potential to do some real good. And, you know, we've talked about this as well on previous episodes is the concept of a, you know, frequent flyer levy on, on air travel. You know, it's still a long ways out uh, before we're going to be flying with, you know, electric planes or even hydrogen ones. And so, you know, it's important that, that we have some sort of a fee structure in place to, you know, basically disincentivize people to be racking up, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles a year. The proposals that seem to be the most sort of equitable are ones where you would pay an increasing fee based on your trips taken. So, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of everybody gets one or two trips as a freebie. And then, 
you know, then the price of your flights go up, you know, incrementally. Because the reality is while we continue to plug the importance of buying voluntary carbon offsets when you fly, the reality is only 2% of people are doing that right now. So in order to really help the industry transition, we need a, a fee in, in place. Yeah, which feels really important, especially in line with what Jeremy mentioned in his interview, which is that the goal is not to make travel more elite, but definitely to make it smarter, especially, you know, in terms of climate change. Yeah. Well, that's bringing up another thing in my mind, um, which I know you've talked about, um, but interested in your thoughts um, as things have kind of unfolded, which is the situation in Maui um, and this whole debate about whether tourists should be coming after a, you know, arguably a climate related disaster or not, when they should be coming back, et cetera. So I don't know if you have thoughts there, but. Oh my gosh. I, I feel like it's been so interesting kind of watching everything unfold, which which maybe sounds horrible because um, obviously it's a terrible situation, but it's a real dilemma in the climate and tourism space, but also in the you know tourism and, and ethics space around, can you go visit somewhere? Should you not go visit somewhere? And so if you've been following anything about the situation in Maui, you probably heard initially that there was kind of a huge outcry for people not to come visit, to stay off the island, to really, really limit tourism as people were coping with the fires going on on the island. And more recently, there's kind of been the reverse, where there's now been a huge call for tourists to not cancel their flights, to come to the island, and to really invest in the economy. Because on Maui, tourism accounts for about 40% of the economy. Um, and so wow. seeing the, I know, and so seeing this just huge drop in tourists, there was actually a really good stat by the New York Times that said that around, yeah, that every day the island's seeing about 4,250 less visitors, which represents a loss of 9 million a day. It's astounding. And it's it's a really difficult thing. Um and I, I totally don't know what the answer is. I think listening to local opinion, <laughs> right? I mean, uh. it it does seem like a delicate thing, and maybe that's where, as Jeremy, you know, pointed out in in the interview, it's important to really get in touch with or get a sense of what's going on locally before you travel, right? Whether it's a yeah an acute situation like this where you have this you know horrible disaster, um, or you know it's something where you know, you might be traveling to, you know, talking about fire, you might be traveling to a region where, you know, you have a, a wildfire season, right? And there may be times when good to come, um, but maybe times when it's not as much because folks are trying to fight that fire or, you know, you've got hurricane season. I mean, there's all these different things, I think, to think about. Um, but I think it feels like the message is these people within these economies still need the tourist revenue. And so, mm -hmm. you know, don't cancel your trip, but make an effort to sort of respectful and mindful of what's going on there. Definitely. I mean, do your research. That's, I think, the, the most basic takeaway that, that we can give this episode is, is do your research. Um, yeah. And I also, that reminds me a lot of what we talked about earlier with our reason for hope for this week with the climate summit in Africa. One of the points that they made that Jason and I both took note of um, was that people need to not just invest in these places when there's a climate emergency going on. And I think that's really relevant in the case of Maui, where just investing after the wildfire like isn't going to cut it. We need they kind of need the year round revenue, but also it shouldn't always be through destructive, you know, extractive means, which oftentimes tourism can be. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, when we're talking about, you know, things like foreign aid and whatnot, it's essential that we're really paying, you know, to help mitigate climate change because at the end of the mm -hmm. day, we're not going to be able to, you know, write a big enough check to deal with the the impacts if we don't deal with the the mitigation side. So, yeah, let's help these areas proactively better prepare for the impacts of climate change and help them, you know, reduce their reliance on fossil fuels. Yes, we're going to have to, you know, help out in the situations like what just occurred in Maui, but let's not save our money for the, when the disaster strikes, let's invest proactively. Definitely. Yeah. Tourists obviously need to do their research, need to be, you know, actively thinking about how they can be lowering their carbon footprint when they're traveling somewhere. Um, but obviously there's also the other side too of the tourism industry, uh, the local level. And Jeremy just made this wonderful point that I wanted to bring up once more, which was that we can't, spend too much time on that 
dividing the responsibility and not doing anything. We're hitting a point right now that, you know, we're seeing wildfires, flooding, all this that's really impacting particularly a lot of places that are really popular for travel. And it's it's going to be interesting and difficult to see how some of these places that have been really popular to go to won't be accessible anymore. Which I think is a good segue into the question we always ask, which is, you know, what can we do? Hmm. And this week we've got sort of two options we're putting forth to all of you. Um, the first is to email your representative and tell them to push for, you know, a carbon fee and dividend. If you're in Canada, you're already covered there. You know, it helps incentivize industry, including tourism, to move away from fossil fuels. And it's, you know, in a very predictable way, right? People know how much that price is going up each year and they can plan for it. You know, as we mentioned, the dividend protects lower income folks. So email your representatives today and just tell them, you know, you're worried about climate change and that we need to pass a carbon fee and dividend. We'll have talking points on our website. Yes. And for our second option, and this is, you know, a little bit big and small, but really focus on reducing both the climate and environmental impact of your travel. So that's at this big scale of, you know, taking a couple long trips instead of lots of short ones or traveling regionally, or even at the slightly smaller scale, you know, really doing your research. So learning about the place that you're going to, what issues they're grappling with, you know, if you are flying, buying reputable offsets, or even doing the really small things like making sure to bring a water bottle so that you're not buying plastic bottles when you're out. But yeah, we have more tips on our website, once again, for both of these options. So definitely make sure to check it out. Yeah, lots lots to do on this. And I think the message is travel is important, you know, for lots of reasons, but we need to learn to travel smarter and leave no trace needs to become part of it. Well, that's a wrap for this week's episode. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Uh, for those of you who are looking for more emails they can look forward to in their inbox, sign up for our monthly newsletter. We keep it short on the fluff and heavy on substance. So, you know, whether you're looking for some cool climate talking points for that next barbecue or meaningful ways to get involved in fighting climate change, it's a great source. Climate Optimist is made possible by Climate Stewards Collective. You can find us on the web at climateoptimist.co. And as always, don't forget to follow us on social at Climate Optimist Podcast. Mm -hmm.